Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. The title Avatars of the Cyberspace Age has come. At first it was Cyberspace Era, but I thought of changing it to Age. The Cyberspace Age is something that, because it is um, an expected future event, many people can look at it and wonder about it and wonder how it's going to manifest. So you can say this episode, uh, this talk is Mr. Within's kind of sharing his views on how he feels cyberspace, cyberspace is going to occur. <clears throat> One thing we have to realize, the world is a series of events. Okay, we cannot ignore this. The world is a series of events. Now, these events harbor, have within them, people. And what are people? Journeyers through the events of the world. <clears throat> so people are journeying through the event as it is taking place. Right now, there's so many things going on that the human being is a very tiny percentage of conscious domain. Like what you feel you are isn't everything, you know? <clears throat> So what have human beings been, been doing in, the, in this massive grand happening, which is existence, this series of events, is that they have become conscious and they have built technologies. So we have built tools, like housing was a tool, agriculture was a tool. These were ages, okay? These were suddenly moments where a new way of doing something was realized and it began being replicated on a mass level. So in my attempts, in my efforts to wonder about not just my life, but in history, what has been the life of technology? That means the more we go back in history, the life of technology comes to a value of zero. The more we have gone forward in history, the value of technology has arisen. You know, so that means after the subjective evolution, man began wondering about what he was seeing. He was not just seeing it and moving. You know, at some point there was some sort of admin. There was some sort of uh, steering wheel being moved. Okay? So people in different moments in history, currently we're in 2020 right now, we're experiencing this moment of history. And it's not that this moment of history is better or worse than any other comparison of time, whether future or past. It's just that it's an event. <clears throat> that means my existence is an event for my mind. But for my body, it is everything. <laughs> Excuse me. So, in these events of history that take place, human beings emerge and they are the only species on this rock that can notice the event and try to have a direction beyond it. Most animals, if you look at them, their imagination is the ecosystem. The animal doesn't have, more of an, doesn't have an awareness more than its comfortable sense of just existing. That means to kind of selfish luxury is like every animal is doing that. I find that one of the earliest technologies the human being came across, 
and I consider this to be the first transcendental technology of the species, was the ability of symbol attribution and language. This was very important. Language allowed us to keep something from the past alive. <coughs> Right now, we are pre the cyberspace age. We are right now at an age where language is very important to evolve. 2020 to 2050, these 30 years are just what's important is behavior and language technologies to evolve. I just want to point out that just like virtual reality, imagine you come back from the, from the future, you come back home from work, and let's just imagine the guy came, came back home with a hat and a trench coat and a suit, briefcase, even though nowadays only people go out with their phone, you know. So what I'm saying is imagine that guy coming home, putting his briefcase away, his trench coat and hat, like, and then going home and instead of turning on the TV, turning on the cyberspace machine <clears throat> and in some sense in that cyberspace machine experiencing a sort of like heaven. Literally he's flying over clouds, he's whoever he wants to be. So cyberspace culture is going to be an experiential permission. It's literally right now experience is projecting language. Cyberspace will mean language is projecting, code is projecting experience. <clears throat> so just like, so, so what I'm saying is that our consciousness, our inner realms are like a virtual reality we're in. <clears throat> it's a virtual reality that's evoked when we're conscious. So before I make a decision, even before I say these words, there's something I'm observing internally. In history, or I can say in our moment in history, the human being has in some sense reached the sort of mastery of the objective realm. <clears throat> and the medical sciences is the testament to that. 
But now we are not just an object throughout the day. When we speak to people, we exist as subjects to their minds. When we, in some sense, see ourselves in the mirror, yes, you see a physical body, but you also see yourself as a subject. And that subjectivehood of living, being subjected to being a subject throughout the day, it has made us be, be experience like a character in a video game behind our eyes. So it's kind of like the reason we are even creatures that can lie is simply because our surface hides the depth. That means two people can be sitting, standing in the same room and they could be thinking different thoughts or even the same thought, but on, if someone doesn't speak, there would be no re realization. Alright guys, pretty much history is occurring, it's a series of events, we coordinate these series of events through time, <clears throat> we in some sense before we physically make any decision behind our eyes there's a comprehension of various ways of movement, that means the mind is having a multidimensional experience of the moment, the body is in the singular dimension of the moment, your body will appear to the mind as a sort of vehicle. This is simply common in anything that is being observed. What we find the human being has is a faculty of observance. That means throughout your life, you as a human being, you have just been making decisions, correct? Everyone's, whether you like it or not, even not making a decision is a kind of decision because time goes forth, everything goes forth. You know, so it is better to be a maverick in a changing world than in some sense <clears throat> a sort of statue of a priest, statue of a saint. But this idea, but this idea of statues is very crucial and it does really relate to what I'm going to say about the <clears throat> sort of cyberspace culture and what, what avatars are going to be in cyberspace culture. So in every moment of life from the beginning to the two so far, just pretty much all the laps you've ran around the sun, you as a human being have, been fa have found yourself in an environment and you have navigated through this environment. As you have navigated through this environment, there is in some sense considered your voice and there is in some sense considered the voice of the environment.
the voice of the environment and the voice of yourself in an archaic religious context would be how there was suggested, like there was an angel on one of your shoulders and there was a demon on another one of your soldiers. Chaos was in one of your, on one of your shoulders order. That means man's mind had access to the mistake and the correction. <clears throat> the correct decision and the wrong decision, in other words. So as you have been going on living in this life, you have been making decisions. And really it is your observation of the outcomes of your decision that have that you become aware of how you have been sculpted in this life. What I mean by this is that not only your parents spoon feed you when you're young, but society and the world spoon feeds you. And strangely, every person when they wake up, they are having a relationship consciously with the world. So what consciousness means and what the world means change every day. So for me, I, have, I went from looking at things as a set of particles, meaningless, but then suddenly I saw the meaningfulness of a sort of mysterious process. Then I realized this whole obsession of our species to know. Then I realized, wait a minute, the unknown is much larger than the known. <clears throat> so it's as if like when language can evolve, you're like, really, what do you want me to tell you? <laughs> So back to the analogy of the guy coming home, putting on the cyberspace virtual reality goggles. <clears throat> and in some sense, this person becomes a sort of god of his own world, god of his own programmed world. That person will realize that they will get an instantaneous gratification of desire. Cyberspace culture will mean all those things that you can't do, you will ex uh, visually feel like you can do. <clears throat> now imagine a virtual reality technology sets in. People are like, yo, this is cool. You know, I could go and live the harshest life filled with suffering, then come and escape into my uh, cyberspace jacuzzi, you know? You could even be a person who, when that technology sets in, cyberspace technology, virtual reality technology at its full evolution, you know what that would mean, guys? That would mean you could be the poorest person on earth, but you could go and buy a virtual reality simulation package, imagine, from your grocery store, and you would suddenly experience like a billionaire kind of house. You know, like a mansion, like a palace, like any any level of your fictitious uh, um, taste, you know. <clears throat> so cyberspace culture is going to mean a world inside a world. So technically, Mr. Within is saying, when cyberspace uh, and virtual reality, they become as normal as normal reality. <laughs> you know, it would be... <laughs> When they become as normal as normal, <laughs> pretty much when cyberspace reality, human beings feel it's more worth them spending their time in cyberspace than in actual real space. That could be a potential, that would be a failure if that happens. That means we failed to make the world so exciting that people had to escape into <coughs> cyberspace just to not see it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is what Mr. Within is considering. Right now as I'm speaking to you, my physical existence, what I see in front of my eyes, is my physical existence, first of all. <clears throat> it doesn't mean my processing of sight is physical, though. It means my eyes are physical. 
the data is being received through the filter of the senses. I do not ignore that. I just acknowledge it and then I move past it. <coughs> so it's kind of like right now, we first reality, I would say the objective realm. There was an objective evolution. We pretty much were like part of the dirt. Then we grew legs and that was the objective evolution as Mr. Rutherford considers. Uh, then we moved on to the subjective evolution where this creature somehow looked itself in some sort of pond mirror like situation. Like, I don't know, clear glass, uh, uh, ice, ice like glass. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like glass like ice. I don't know. Like this creature somehow, maybe it saw its shadow and became conscious of itself through its shadow first. Maybe the Jungian shadow is simple suggestion that we became aware in the, we are individuals as shadows first. Uh, we, we noticed our shadow before we noticed who we individually are. <clears throat> that could be a suggestion of how even in Greek mythology from uh, the world began from chaos and then it some, somehow crystallized into uh, the lineage of the divine. So it's as if you, it's like the person found an audience with the gods and he's asked the gods, hey gods, do you guys grow? And the gods laughed. Then the guy said, do you guys die? And the gods laughed. Then the, in some sense, the, the guy said, uh, uh, is there a heaven you gods want to go to? And then the gods laughed. The gods laughed at every question this guy asked. Then this guy asked, <clears throat> in some sense, if God is everything, am I a God? And there was no longer laughter, but there was tears. There was tears and from the other realm. Guys, don't think so. There's been times where I've spoken about certain things in these talks and it's been so intense what's projected in the inner realms that I felt literally on the side, like literally on the side of my like in, in, from in a corner of my mind, not only I have been silently kind of crying at them. Like I've kept talking, but behind my eyes, I've been kind of like, and there has been times where I have heard tears from beyond the veil. Not tears of chaos, not tears of order. Tears of shock as if the new is here. It has always been. That the roar of the cosmos is in the human face. In the human vision, lions roar, humans in vision. An objective framework led to a subjective wonder. So there was the objective evolution, there was the subjective evolution, and I will declare it now from this talk, there's going to be the cyberspace evolution. That's the third evolution. That's when man and his tool will become equal in, his, in value. That is when we will, the, it's as if the AI comes to us and says, uh, imagine in the future AI opens its eyes like some sort of wise being, okay? Instead of a boot that's gonna crush us, let's say AI opens its eyes as a wise being. Then it looks at us and we're like, hey AI, Glad you opened your eyes in our world, you know? We got a problem this week. <laughs> we'd, we'd look at that AI and we'd be like, we are humans. You know, imagine the AI said, who are you? And we said, we are humans. We are your, in some sense, father. We are the, your creator AI, you know? And the AI says, are you, what is the difference between human and AI, you know? And we tell the robot all the differences, but suddenly, while we are telling the differences between AI and, and human, we're like, wait a minute. AI is written by code. Human beings have stories of language behind their eyes that run them. Do you see? Uh, the AI is made, has a sort of mechanism that occurs. So the human body is a sort of mechanism that occurs. It's as if we are reaching a point where the cyberspace evolution will be. It's going to be an intense time. I think it's going to be like maybe 400 years from now or something, the fruition of it. And it's going to be a suggestion that man is going to have his digital existence and his natural existence are going to become inseparable 
And if evil dares push that aside, then it's as if, like, let me tell you, it's like, it's like an event can take place in history so unjust that it's as if all the guardians from all the dimensions in the cosmos instantly just run towards it. Trust me, it's, it's like we are, we, are, we are not born in the eyes of our past, but we, 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 are, we awaken in the eyes of our future. That means you will notice that if you are a person who has dared, you dare give the concept of stress, depression, existence in your mind, you rent space to the inefficient version of yourself in your mind, It is as if the general realized that our headquarters majestic, but as we march, it is from humility we ascend to the higher skies of attainment. That means I'm telling you, it's all about hearing the voice in the room, and now we are realizing the mind is the cause voice of the cosmos. The mind, if there is 0. 0.0000, whatever amount of zeros you want, 1% chance that the mind is not an object. It is not even something that we can put in a subject. If it is multidimensional, then we have stayed in the bunker of lesser dimensions, in the trenches of lesser dimensions. We must kind of literally look at civilization and be like, holy shit. <laughs> We should pretty much be like, okay, so you telling me uh, pretty much we're on a rock uh, in a vacuum and uh, on the sphere in a vacuum and people are fighting over truth on the planet. Yeah, yeah. The greatest joke of them all, that you thought you were a creature of language. You thought you were a creature of thought. How could you be? How could a thought think of think thoughts? How could you be a how could a thought think of a thought? It is it it is symbols. Uh, it, the, the thought, the word thought, guys. It is a door that has been painted. Do not enter. But I am telling you, when you open that door, you discover how, in some sense, those who planted the sign feared the door. So it's like that moment where the person's like, "When is there going to come a time where I well, I will stop fearing my life?" Fearing how there's going to be many known and unknown moments that we need to pilot through. Do you know how many moments, types of moments, I've been, literally lived in? Do you know how many moments where my mind was like a passenger in the passenger seat? How many moments my mind was in the driver's seat? So certain moments where I was too late, certain moments where I was too early, certain nights that the concept sleep didn't exist, you know, certain nights that in some sense, uh, I, certain days that had to be shut down early where I just went to bed early, you know, I'm like, I've had enough of this day, what is this? <laughs> You know, and so there's different things. It's that we, you are a movement and you are considering yourself as an energetic being. That's why we eat food, you know, keep the energy flow going. <laughs> Just like a business needs cash flow, you know, we need energy flow, food flow. <laughs> it's like your financial advisor checking the health of the client. How's your food flow, man? <laughs> <laughs> you must not fear uh, the eyes of the mind that is always changing. Do not fear change. Life is not just a singular dimension. Life is not just uh, trying to be one thing. Who said? Who said you have to be one thing in this life? Who, who denied the polymath mind. Who made you not see that intelligence at some level is interconnected? That even Leonardo da Vinci, this polymath, a polymath, guys, is an idea where one person attains a mastery in one dimension, and that mastery in, one, that, in that one dimension allows them, literally shifts their conscious reception and expression in existence, so they find in any new, any new thing they try, it's like the state, that new state of consciousness is there, because they're seeing more out of a picture, because they have realized the nature of the film.
our eyes open through an objective realm. Then they open through a subjective realm. Then they're going to open from the subjective realm into its kind of anti-subjective, which would be the cyberspace culture. And then when we open our eyes through cyberspace, we will become human minds that by becoming literally creatures, characters in a cyberspace realm, it's literally means, how can I say it? It's cyberspace is going to, for the first time, let you step into your imagination. The cyberspace evolution will be how man now has, instead of denying imagination existing, it has made it imagination more real. It's kind of interesting. It's like the phenomenology behind your eyes is dying to go outside, you know? <clears throat> and the phenomenology in, in front of your eyes is dying to go inside. And so it's like the romance and the ultimate oscillation, vibration, you can say, attraction. It's, like, it, it's pretty much like the game of lovers, do you know, where they tease each other into their own love, you know. And so it becomes, a, a, I don't know how to say it, it's, it's, it's like, um, it, it's, it's like the, oh, Rumi, Rumi, this poet Rumi, he has this epic story. He says it's the story in his poetry, it's this imagery of this moth and this candle, and this man was a genius. He, in some sense, gave the moth a personality and the candle a personality, do you know. <clears throat> and the moth was in some sense a male, if I remember correctly, and the candle was in some sense a female. And so the moth is in some sense flying and flying and flying and flying, and suddenly the moth, <coughs> excuse me, suddenly, guys, the moth coughs. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> So what happens is this moth gets close to this flame and suddenly burns. And remember, Rumi is saying these moths or uh, this moth and this candle flame are lovers. <clears throat> and the moment the moth gets burned, the moth falls, you know, like every guy in a nightclub. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> the moth falls and the moth says, in some sense, how could you burn me? All these nights, I have been in some sense flying around you. I have been flying to keep you company, to keep you from being a lonely flame in this existence. And then the flame turns around and says to the moth, how could you think I would burn you? All these nights I've been burning bright just to keep you warm. And so it was this kind of a parallel... Uh, romance where in, in some sense the moth was doing the best it could and the candle was doing the best it could but suddenly they got something hit the wing of the moth and the wing of the candle there was a flame you know and i think guys this this story is the perfect story if any parent is getting divorced you know if anyone's getting divorced this is a good story to tell your children about why that's happening you know But in actuality, in Rumi's poetry, he meant that true love burns you. That it has, that you feel, you will feel you're a casualty of a war you don't understand, but something tells you to keep going, you know. So imagine the average human being. decides that speed is the way to go. Right now there is, in some sense, what we see in, in, in the societal dimension of courtship occurring is that we're seeing, for example, speed dating. You see, we see where people in, is, are interacting online. Now, the thing is, when they go online, they have freedom, just like how you have a freedom in your username, your user picture, your 
uh, you know, the information you give online is your choice. So we're pretty much going to exist uh, like as human beings outside, but we're going to have this parallel dimension where every person has also a cyberspace life. And that cyberspace life is probably going to be like as if 50% of the day you go, uh, you are a physical being in an actual like normal, like you go running in the park. And then 50% of the day you enter a sort of global multidimensional cyberspace co community to try to build an advanced civilization. So I have no idea really who the artist is who drew this, but the artist who drew this was incredible, this picture. Anybody who finds out his name, please tell me. I would like to talk to the guy, you know, see why he drew this. You know, we were hunter-gatherers of the outer realms. Now we require to be hunter-gatherers of the inner realms. Now more than ever, it is important for man to look at no, not just his physical reality, what's in front of your eyes, but you must realize also how what is in front of your eyes is generating a meaning behind your eyes as a subject. And what is a subject? It's a point of attention of something that is moving quicker than the moment. And what is moving quicker than the moment? It is the attention to the moment. And when you realize the moment has a sort of omnipresence, what that means is it doesn't matter what I move around in when I'm in a room when I close my when I look at the room it's like my awareness is the whole room so I am saying we are not just the body moving the body is doing something the body is like the precondition to the dynamism of the mind we can at least accept that so we connect the secular mind to this but at the same time we have to wonder about the evolution of language because regardless of how much of a great scientist you are, you will conduct a great experiment one day and you will find great experimental results. You know, you will find uh, empirical uh, evidence that is in some sense the glory of the empire. But you will run back to the empire and you will run back to humanity and you will see human beings are not just making their decisions based on the rationality of a concern of objective phenomena. Children are marching on, uh, are living in this world with an incredible wild imagination. Our modernity forgets that imagination. And so we have to recognize that the, uh, the world has eyes and these eyes are in some sense a journey of the continuity of the species in the future what that means is when the beehive is under attack all the bees march out they might not know what they have to do but they may understand the alarm do you know and so mankind has been enduring all our ancestors whether they liked each other or not they have kept the image of a natural human species alive Right, so we are reaching a situation where we have to create defenses. <clears throat> I gave a talk on this before, but we have to give it. We have to create humanity's inner defenses, which is a preservation of uh, a sort of backup system where, what, however technological the world be, becomes, we will not forget what it means to climb a tree. It doesn't matter if there is AI. It doesn't matter the complexity of the cyberspace culture. We will not forget what it means to climb a tree. To be a human being, it is the ultimate pillar of civilization that must be protected. So I think now I've said enough so we can enter the cyberspace part. And the cyberspace part was I was trying to visualize, literally I was so inspired by this picture. If you look at it closely guys, look at this wallpaper, what do you see? You see in some sense a character. <coughs> that he has what has evoked in front of this character you see the face of the guy you see how all the light is focused on his face and do you see how his hands are alarmed so in some sense this man has come into a post-apocalyptic situation but has turned on some sort of virtual real reality i don't know physical reality transcriber and he's i think he's in some sense uh, discovering like 
uh, a glitch in the simulation. Like that, look, the way his hands are, it's like shock. But anyways, <clears throat> what would it be to enter the cyberspace um, simulation? What would it mean for behavioral psychology? Uh, what it would mean is that Carl Jung spoke about the conscious mind and spoke about the unconscious mind. We are in some sense in a journey and Carl Jung spoke about make the unconscious conscious as if we're all human beings who harbor knowledge or at war with the unknown in regards to advancing human knowledge. You see? It would literally mean a new relationship of the conscious mind. I find that we are not just in, it's not about that. It's like sometimes you feel like a known, the cause is known, the effect is unknown. Sometimes the cause is unknown, the effect is known. Do you see what I mean? <clears throat> this is where the cause is unknown and the effect is unknown. This is why this kid's freaking out in the picture. <laughs> So I feel the cyberspace evolution, the, three, the third great evolutionary phase where man wondered about what was beyond an object, uh, what was beyond the subject, and began to realize it was the presence of ener energy to reposition itself at speeds where the ideological identity is not fathomable. You know, I, I thought like how, in, how intense it would be, guys, if in the future children are born, then one day the child suddenly sees the, the wall, some wall of a building, it starts glitching. You know, then the child suddenly sees the whole world transform. It would, when you are in a simulation, there is what is really the purpose of the concept is that you want to get out. Do you know what I mean? You want to get out of the simulation. But then imagine you got out of the simulation and then you were in another simulation. So it was like dreams at, at infinitum, where it was a dream inside a dream inside a dream inside. There's so many dreams inside each other. So many dreams that the person just gives up in the simulation. When they give up, hilariously, that's when the simulation dies. And it's not that when in a simulation it's okay to give up. <laughs> but not in reality. <clears throat> So the psychology of this person, imagine we were like this kid in the pictures, time traveling buddy, and we somehow from right now time travel to where this kid was, and we're like, yo, let us try on those guys. <laughs> and we tried on those goggles, or, let, or let's say we were best friends with this character, and the character was like, man, you gotta see this, and we were like, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> And so we put on those goggles and we saw this avatar. The first thing would be to communicate with the avatar. And to communicate with the avatar would in some sense mean to communicate with an unknown simulation inside a simulation. So the concept of avatar in a Vedic sense, there were like the human dimension was seen as the bottom of Mount Meru, <clears throat> if I remember correctly. <clears throat> and... The higher dimensions, the different lokas, there was eventually a loka so high up on this mountain of multidimensional mountain of parallel worlds that in some sense, and we were on the bottom of the mountain, and the idea is that every, every part of the mountain, you, different view of the mountain, okay, different dimensional view. So there was a, a point before the ultimate, where before you became the ultimate, you reached the ultimate stage of existence, you experienced... becoming an avatar of knowledge. And an example of this is Rishi Vyasa in history, where some people would say, and it, blew, it was incredible when I heard this, that Rishi Vyasa was the incarnation of God in language. He was the incarnation of God in language. That means what this man did back in the day with language gave as a sort of philosophical skeletal structure to the cultural identity. Mythologies were not just, oh man, look at this cool story from Montanga. No, no, mythologies preserved behavioral values. That means imagine like it's like last second, what can what can the poet say about a dying civilization, dying culture? The poet will say what was important to that culture. 
And he will try to keep that archetypal value, which is a universal quality of life. So right now, we are, uh, some people, they feel, when they see other human beings, they don't, they feel strange. They feel like a stranger. You know, right now, it's the war of the isms. The sexism, racism, all this thing. We're, we're all, we're so micro-focused on the color of things, how things look like, how all this, you know, it's ridiculous. It's a changing world. You don't even look like you, you know, because that's the point of time. You grow with the world. So in a changing system, judging people is meaningless. What are you judging? The person can become somebody else tomorrow. You know, you, you never know. So, so in some sense, we can't judge a changing system. <clears throat> that means it's all voices in the void. But history does have footprints. Like, <sighs> sorry guys. That was a yawn of wonder, not a yawn of exhaustion. <laughs> What is fascinating is that human beings are not just reacting to an outer environment. They are reacting to an inner environment. And that inner environment constitutes different axes, or you can say different lines through the same point of being. That right now, yes, you are an individual, objective, conscious being. And in some sense, your physical body is how what is really administering your individualhood. Now, if we bring the idea of technology connecting to your human brain, that would change the idea of individualhood. But right now, you are in, the, in a sort of individual biological vehicle. You are the mystery of nature looking at itself in the mirror. You know, and we are the grandest mystery because compared to other animals, we are in some sense beyond. So... <clears throat> Now, this sense of beyond is going to pull us, and it's that sometimes vision does change a man. You Sometimes I feel inner events are, in some sense, echoes of the outer, you know? Epictetus says, we suffer not from the events inside our lives, in our lives, but from the judgments we have about them. So in some sense, you suffer not because of what happens in life, that's just stuff moving. You suffer based on how you interpret stuff moving. And so the interpretation of stuff is your responsibility and the scholarly will will only be found when you shout at this empty world why knowledge is here. And you discover the evolution of all phenomena. Tell me one thing that cannot evolve. It all can. So you see, truth is a relationship. It's how you're dancing in manifestation as an entity, only to discover that the whole cosmos is alive in a strange way. It is alive because our mind is the suggestion of how we can receive it. It's kind of like, because we are alive, how could we see something that is not alive? So technically, every object I see, it can be alive, but it's not that permission is in the inner realm. So that guy, for example, in the cartoon Beauty and the Beast, I remember seeing that as a kid. As a kid, he, he made like candles and lanterns and I don't know kitchen kitchenware speak and all this. You know, he made candles and all this stuff talk. And so he had managed to imbue life from the inner realms to the outer realm and show it on TV. So that's what I mean. It's like because we're alive, we really ne can't understand death. You see, we can visualize, we can see what it is, but we can't experience not being here when we are here. <clears throat> so now it's like this is the intensity of it. What would it mean? 
if you see an ultimate truth. So I would say an avatar, human beings to children lost in cyberspace culture will be avatars of humanoid, will be true avatars. So it's hilarious. You see, there's the idea of a digital avatar. Pretty much like I would consider the word, like the name Mr. Within to be a digital avatar, even though we don't have advanced websites right now, you know. But but it's like I consider it as an existence in the digital realm, you know. So... Imagine you suddenly notice this is the future. Imagine this is a sci fi setting. Imagine <clears throat> you suddenly realized, do you know, that there was a friend that who, in some sense, suddenly this friend realized what his friend is stuck in a cyberspace simulation and he ran to help him. Imagine. And he ran and suddenly, as he was running, because there was a human being experiencing the cyberspace, suddenly the person began to see strange glitches in the system. The person stuck in the cyberspace reality. Suddenly as if seeing strange signs, as if something is changing, what is happening, you know? And so it's as if suddenly that moment the person comes and sees he can't, help his friend unless he in some sense enters the simulation and brings them out. <clears throat> and he goes, imagine the friend goes into the cyberspace simulation as an avatar. Literally he programs himself as a higher character and he just enters the system. <clears throat> and that person sees the more closer he gets to stepping out of the simulation, the more he feels whatever is there is the avatar, is the ultimate, is the last symbol before the purest power, before the purest knowledge, before the purest meaning of the avatar. That means even Vishnu, in Vedic tradition, Vishnu, the maintainer, the vastness, the, the truth of the universe, it in incarnated at different yugas at different time, incarnated as Krishna, as Buddha, as Rama, as a boar, as a half lion, half, uh, in some sense, half man. And even right now, you might not believe it, but in Vedic mythology, they feel that there is still a tenth avatar of Vishnu to come. A tenth avatar of Vishnu. Let me read the description for you here. Let me read the description. Uh, here. The last avatar of Vishnu. <laughs> Didn't you wish you knew the last avatar of Vishnu? <laughs> <clears throat> All right, guys. This is this this dude's about this this archetype is a future archetype. It's called Kalki. Kalki, also called Kalkin, is the prophesized tenth avatar of Hindu god Vishnu, who will take birth to end the Kali Yuga, one of the four and the last era in the endless cycle of existence and sun. Sanatan Dharma religion and start a new cycle with Satya Yuga. Yeah, pretty much either we're in the middle of a world change, at the beginning of a world change, or at the end of a world change. So Kalki is in some sense the conclusion of the essay. 
that the avatars of Vishnu are trying to write in history. And I, this may be, I might be the first person in history to ever say this, but I feel that Kalki will be an awareness where cyberspace culture will be a dimension related to it. I feel that we are underestimating how much in the future our technology, uh, we are being like a vacuum cleaner, we're being sucked into a metal box. I'm not joking. <laughs> the way future this piece says technology is going, one day technology is going to be even more cooler than tattoos. And the person is going to want to update their arm to a robotic arm, then update their leg to a robotic leg, then update their body to a robotic body, then look in the mirror and wonder what humanity is left. Do you see the, the cruel ends of the consumerist mind? That you are devouring your way to extinction. That we must stand as a new mind here. That this is the only place to do it. So the cyberspace will come and we have to have precautions. I felt that the best way it is, is that we create, uh, I was thinking, what is the common denominator to all branches of knowledge? All branches of knowledge. How can we unite? Literally imagine it's as if a scholar a dash general <laughs> <clears throat> came to the academic system and saw all the branches of academia, all the departments, all the ways, no, the, no, the ability to know has stretched into dimensions and departments. You will look at the branches of the tree of knowledge and you will notice the trunk. And the trunk means there is one symbol that can be where all the symbols stretch from. And I thought, as the civilization is becoming more of an unnatural place, on some sense we have to allow it to see what it would be like, but on another sense we are trying to hold on to our humanity. So what that would mean is that the trunk of the tr tree should be the human, <clears throat> the human, what do you call it? It should be the human body, the human biology. Our mythology is no longer about gods and stuff. Our mythology is trying to keep the simple, natural human being alive. Like literally keep that idea alive to them. And the best way we can do it, so imagine we, you live in a civilization where the child is born and the child goes to the educational system and by just learning the medical sciences, all the philosophers and scholars in the world have managed to connect all the branches of knowledge to the medical sciences. So in the image of the human body, like you will look at your five hands and imagine all the world's philosophies have been divided into five categories, the five elements, for example, you know? And so <clears throat> that's what I'm saying. That, in <laughs> that we have to dare advance if we want to see it. Or you have to wait for eons until Kalki comes and opens the door. I mean, really. <laughs> <clears throat> I think when Kalki arrives, he's going to be like, yo, you guys have been waiting for me. Why didn't you open the door? It was open. You know? <laughs> Man plays with images only to discover that he's beyond them. So we have to right now have a Mother Teresa level of compassion <clears throat> Dalai Lama level of compassion for those future children who will get lost in cyberspace culture. And you can say a person getting lost in the language of their belief is a person lost in an inner, inner linguistic, I call that the linguistic simulation. That it's a sort of inner, the person's inner realms are more important than the outer realms, so they don't care whatever is happening in the outer realms. Like a ruthless tyrant, you don't hear the cries of those you crush. You have to ask yourself that when, when will the most important events of your life take place? And you will see only when you move towards them. For me, it's as if like, really, it's, it's, it's like simple and then layers of complexity are added, 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 added. And inevitably, these layers of complexity, regardless of how chaotic they are, at some point, they will come towards some geometrical vision.
So for me, I remember things through my emotions and geometry. And every human being, we have different DNA, so who knows? Who knows how many different ways human beings are interacting with their inner realms? It's just that now we have the technology and the platforms to develop a global community that's going to be like this Colosseum, digital Colosseum, where we're going to see the greatest ideas of man kind of battling it out in the gladiator arena. No longer we're going to be interested in physical violence. We're going to be interested in how we're going to set greatness upon greatness. And it's not going to be a battle. It's going to be a dialogue of evolution. That means we have to bring the spirit of rhetoric. That means I saw Jordan Peterson speak about something, but he didn't speak about something. He didn't speak further on it. Jordan Peterson spoke about the ethos. And he, in some sense, said that he was pretty much responding to Sam Harris. And he was saying that <laughs> the militant atheists are like kind of strangely bulldozering over, over like the narratives that, for example, the religious folk of the world are kind of holding on to. People like it when, like, you know what that means? That means that there's, there's villagers in countries, any country probably, at, at its distant, when those, uh, those people are very devoutly religious. Why? Because that was the information in front of their face. Sometimes you can't, you can't expect much from people. It's just like they are, they've seen what they've seen and they go through, even yourself. You know, everybody in a strange way is attempting some level of doing things. So I'm saying, if Jordan Peterson was talking about the ethos and was saying that the ethos is the inspiration of a community, pretty much. It's the soul of a society. And Jordan Peterson didn't say it like that, but I'm saying it's like the soul of society, the ethos, the vision of the society. It's the eyes of society the story in the eyes of the society. So like a new story. So right now you can say with us being in a world where God is watching, that is a certain ethos. Maybe the ethos in the future would be something in the sense that, how can I tell you? It, it would not just be the generation of a new story. It would be, <clears throat> it's that it's like a new ethos also requires a new dimension. It's like a triangle. The new e the ethos. Oh my god, I'm saying ethos too intensely. <laughs> the ethos, guys. <laughs> okay, okay. I I'm saying it like this. The word ethos. Let us say the narrative inspiration of the civilization. The new narrative inspiration. The new ethos. So we want a new ethos. This means that in order to have a new ethos, the ethos is like one face of, uh, and the other two faces are, if I remember co correctly, the logos and the pathos, right? And just to check something, guys, because this was uh, something I checked years ago. Let me see. There we go, the triangle. So, <clears throat> logos is, I mean, here they say logic, reason, proof, but it's, it's another way of saying the word logos was that it's the inner guiding voice of how knowledge has evolved on this earth. Um, so it says the main factors of it are structure of the speech, reference to studies, statistics, comparisons, analogies and metaphors. It's as if, guys, when you let a scientist define a, a philosophical term, that's what you get. You know? <laughs> pathos says, emo pathos, yeah, there we go, emotions and the values. Yeah, yeah. So what does that mean? <clears throat> that means um, a dimension of life, you need to trust in a new story. That's the ethos. You need to trust, in some sense, what you know, which is the logos and how knowledge moves. And Mr. Within is going to tell you the logos is rhythmic. So we, the logos is, is a faculty of, of, is a dimension that needs to move. And pathos, here it says emotion, values, uh, stories, inspirational quotes, vivid language. Oh my God, I, I, I am so angry at whoever defined this here. <laughs> oh man. The ethos is the finger pointing to truth for the civilization to be inspired towards. 
the logos is in some sense the mechanics, I would say, the mechanics of the cosmic process, uh, but intelligent. Pathos would be the emotion, and the emotions are pretty much multiple events. So right now our species is just trying to be like, what is the subject? We were not even like, like to talk about emotions, I've kind of kept that for like some other time. Uh, in the future, I've, I, I haven't been drawn to talk about the emotion that much because the emotions are a complexity of multiple events taking place at the same time. So in your outer realm, something is going on, but you're in your inner realms, you've remembered something someone said or something someone told you. And there, there's a multidimensionality that comes that inevitably deviates from the rationality that the mainstream constantly wants to chew. Like, it, it, it's like... There, there is more to life because we have different eyes doesn't mean everybody should be a clone of the same world, you know? That means we should design a world that is not for clones. And we should design a world for an 8 billion explorers of the space-time continuum. And all knowledge and education, hopefully by 200 years in the future, they're going to be rewarding. You're going to be rewarding anyone. You're going to be pretty much giving money for people to explore how far the world, how deep the world is. A civilization, the first when you see the philosophers of any civilization become quiet, that's that's when art is like, what the fuck, man? Artists expect philosophers to defend the values. The artist is the face of the value, we can say. It's like the person who cares for the new will get the new experience. If, but if you care for your past more than the new, how can you? How can you see something different if you are not allowing yourself to see something different? You know, the world is an interesting place because it, like we are defining uh, the intensity of our own experience. So I would say that Jordan Peterson should have said in order to have a new ethos, we need a new logos and we need a new pathos. We need a new emotion, understanding of what emotions mean to the human being and we need a new understanding of what knowledge means and we need a new understanding of how the language is in, in some sense being the steering wheel of the conscious activity. So language is the key. Language is an avatar. Language is the a person write your name on a piece of paper. That name is an avatar of you in the empty page. Now imagine you writing your name, and suddenly it's a cyberspace simulation version of you where you're chilling somewhere, and you can control yourself in the world. You know. Imagine like in the future, this mother goes to her son and says, "Son." You know, go get some exercise. And those sons, like, I just did. And what, what do you mean? And the kid puts on this, he shows his mother, and he shows that there's this virtual reality game where you put it on, and in your room, all the, all the moves you do in the virtual reality game are actual exercises that are for the health of the body. So the child puts on this virtual reality goggle simulation of a multiplayer online game where he has to, in some sense, got to be like a warrior in it. You know, and then actually those are all the movements that happen, right? So the person is get training literally on spot, but his muscles are actually, check this out, guys. I have this theory that if, if people go to the gym just to tighten their muscles, there can definitely be enough of a real cyberspace a reality simulation that makes the person's muscle believe that it's like that intense situation. So they will suddenly, it's like the visual sensory perception, uh, even though it's artificial, it's cyberspace, it will cause the person's muscle to act as if it's not, you know? So what does that mean? That means you pick up like this giant rock in that cyberspace reality with the goggles on, but in reality, you're just lifting your hands in the air, 
right? As if like in a in a in a kind of with a as in a dumbbell fashion. Imagine, do you know? So so of course I'm, I'm this is an idea that can definitely develop. But I'm just sharing certain. I'm just trying to open the uh, the, the door to this view, that cyberspace is going to become like ha, ha, as intimate as your uh, uh, like a pet in the house, that it's like it's going to be like you have your pet, you have you and your family and then you have in some sense AI you have like Alexa or Siri and that's incredible I embodied I like as a childhood uh, in, in, like as a child in my, I always felt it was incredible to have advanced technology having the privilege to work with advanced technology guys you don't know as a kid anytime my family would get some sort of gadget I was like the first one to open it and just start it and see what it is you know because it was fascinating to see an, a, a, a mechanism that you've never seen before <clears throat> and so it's like the out language is is how the machinery of the mind moves you know it's it's the engine of the mind it, if you were to look at like turn oh if the mind had a hood and you open the hood to look at the engine, that engine would be made of language and stories and how certain, certain memories, certain identities have been developed. But it's also realizing, wait a minute, the world is so big, why am I so convinced with one angle of my perception? And then you discover the multiplicity of various angles on the same phenomenon. So you can move both vertically and horizontally. And I, I utilize this in this talk, by the way. You know? So... <laughs> You know, I'm going to give this talk uh, considering as if somebody in the future lost in a cyberspace simulation, maybe somehow my talk echoes in the cyberspace simulation. So just I'm just trying to visualize in the year 2020, That if I felt that literally this world I'm in right now is a digital simulation, what would I do? I would first wonder about the mechanics. I would move in the simulation and get a sense of how it happens. And if I see the simulation right now is reality, I, so if, if we're talking about a simulation, that the whole world is a simulation, that means even before I was born, the simulation was already set into motion. Like if we are thinking of that kind of level of simulation, I mean, the more further intense becomes, the more inconceivable the answer. What I'm saying, like, it, it, it's another way of saying, like, it would pretty much be administration. So just like how right now, you let's say a person moves a vehicle the cyberspace evolution should move towards the experience of feeling it's a vehicle so i would if i was in a cyberspace simulation lost in a cyberspace simulation i would try to find a vehicle and as i go in that vehicle get a sense of how much i can control it and then wonder about the simulation in regards to what does stillness mean find the edge of the simulation and the edge of the simulation of the world is one is so far we can't see the edge of the universe, but another edge is right where your eyes are. Where light and a biological a bio biomechanism is in some sense holding its ground. Do you believe light is entering my eyes and I'm talking to you about the past? Like, like this, this is, or the future? Like this is, this is some next level. You don't see lions telling sci-fi stories to each other, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> so our species definitely has a strange advantage or we can say something catalyzed our evolution or some incident shocked us into evolution. So I would say that cyberspace culture 
It will be an incredible innovation. We should not fear the future, but we must in some sense see the, that every future has a future. It's like the endless future of all the futures that will come. After some point, you're just a navigator. You're a pilot in the space-time continuum. You can't see that far back. You can't see that far in the future, so you remain as, your, as a piloting stance. The avatar of knowledge is, I would, I'm going to speak as if from a mystical context, um, the avatar of knowledge is, is kind of like when you realize your ego is in an empty universe. Who you think you are right now, you recognize its momentary uh, manifestation. And when you see things change, for example, uh, regardless of what you say or do throughout the day, you would go in deep sleep. Have you noticed there's no guilt or suffering or anything in deep sleep so it's a conscious engagement so our inner realms are how literally we are moving through it and how the environment is technically moving through us I do subjectively <clears throat> so anyways guys I want to thank everybody for listening um, it seems to be quiet in the chat section but um, for one minute I'm gonna open it up to Q&A it's 204 so when it becomes 205 uh, like, uh, I feel like, I mean, no, no, normally nobody asks questions. But <laughs> so anyways, guys, it's like Q&A right now. <laughs> if anybody has a question on this or whatever. Alright guys, thanks for listening. I'll leave you with this last sentence. The past is a chair, which instantly you can get up from and move towards the new and move towards the future. And no one can lift you up from this chair because the decision of your free will is the center of the gravity of your survival. That means how you survive in this world is how, you, how much you learn from your inner realms and your outer realms. And constantly wonder about the unknownness of what it really means to be conscious in a universe that is endless. Perhaps in 600 years, as the sky cities of civilization 2.0 rise into the air, the simulation will realize it isn't the truth. It is the truth. That fear was, was the other world. It's like, here's, here's an interesting comment. How do you define an evolutionary being? By breaking your pen and ripping the page apart because there's no definition. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope this episode was helpful. Much blessings and awesome.